Kicking off the list at number 10, boiling. Whenever I get in a bath that's too hot, I think of the medieval times. I can't help it. I can't believe this was once a real thing. I get chills thinking about it. Either water or oil would be used for this ancient punishment. To die by being boiled, that was reserved for those who poisoned others. So if you have any vials of poison, toss it. Don't do it, man, trust me. In 1531, the time King Henry VIII was running the show, they made boiling a capital punishment. So poisoning somebody back then was equal to treason. Therefore, it was agreed you should be boiled slowly in front of of like a room full of people. I would say that's the worst, but I know what's also to come on this list. Number nine, water. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing one could possibly go through, let's take a look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation is still around today. In fact, there's many who pay for it. Yeah, they lie in a dark tub full of salt, then they float and listen to Childish Gambino. It's a magical experience. Your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So this dripping machine, this old water punishment, that was just all bad. You had ice cold water dripping on your forehead and your face over and over for hours and hours. Drops would be at different random time so you can predict it as well. My toes are wiggling while I'm talking about this. This is making me anxious right now. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, a big ass funnel, they would pour nine pints of water down into your, down your, down your throat. So water is horrible in many ways. Number eight, fire. Can't talk about medieval punishments without mentioning this witchy classic. Commonly practiced in Babylonia and ancient Israel, then later on in Europe with the classic witch hunts, burning at the stake didn't come from churches, like many believe. They didn't call the shots there at all. That was mainly how small towns settled local beef. Yeah, by burning at the stake, instead of just like a fist fight at the park. Burning at the stake came in full swing way back in 1431 in France. French disbelievers like Joan of Arc, they were burned at the stake. It was crazy that they actually did this as a form of punishment. This is one of the worst medieval punishments. And believe me, there's a little bit of a silver lining here. It was quicker than most. Sometimes. Gunpowder was sometimes used so that the burning and stuff would be much faster and brighter and louder and much more horrible. A lot worse on paper, but a lot faster. So honestly, I think it's better. History is insane. Another red hot punishment used in medieval times was when the accused had to hold a red hot iron bar and then walk a few steps with it. A red hot iron bar, your hands were literally toast at that point. Here's where it gets even worse though. Three days later, the accused would come back to the court and then when the bandages were removed, if their hands were healing, they started to heal, they were deemed innocent. They were on the path to goodness and whatever. If their hands were still in horrible condition from say, I don't know, holding a red hot iron bar, then they were pronounced guilty. That's how the courts worked back then. Number seven, the rack. On to something not so hot and fast, but rather dull and slow, the rack is surprisingly well known. It was originally introduced to the Tower of London around 1420. The Duke of Exeter referred to this device as his daughter. What a weirdo. It's like guys who call their car like she. It's like, okay, just a little bit too close to your automobile, man. Relax. It was an open bed frame type device where your ankles were tied at the bottom and your hands were tied at the top. Already we're off to a horrible start. It was horizontal as well and sometimes it was up. It was, it was all bad. It would just leave you hanging by these ropes and these ropes were slowly tightened more and more, obviously causing some problems to muscles and joints that were, you know, holding things in place. This was done to extract information. This is also one of the worst things I've heard. Even getting tickled like this would be horrible. I couldn't even imagine. I make jokes because I'm uncomfortable. Honestly, hit that thumbs up to spread some good vibes because we're not even halfway done, folks. Number six, molten metal. This was another form of cow capital punishment, and if you've seen Game of Thrones, it'll ring a familiar bell. A few of these do, actually, yikes. Metal would be heated up in a cauldron for a long, long time to the point where it was liquid, it was molten metal, just a soup of minerals. Look, we said this video wasn't for the faint-hearted, and here at Bumblebee, we like to keep that promise. They would then pour the molten metal on your head, or more commonly known, this would they pour it down the throat of the accused. Obviously, it wasn't done as a method to extract information, it was done to brutally end someone's life. Because they're not talking after that, of course. Execution by molten metal was supposedly done to a wealthy Roman general, Marcus Licinius Crassus, back in ancient times. The metal would burn your muscles and skin, literally cooking it, and then after a few moments, it would harden. Bad, bad, not good. 
And speaking of amputations, the classic rhinotomy is back. When is it not though? Pretty much every historical society was chopping off noses for some reason or another. This is because a mutilation of the extruding facial parts, so nose, ears, and lips, had detrimental effects on sensory, but it was also a permanent alteration of the most expressive parts of the human body. Rhinotomy was practiced by Greeks, Indians, Romans, Biazetines, Chinese peoples, and so on. While it was more prevalent in the Biazetiums than the Ottomans, it it didn't change the fact that an unfaithful woman was subjected to it while the man could get away with just a flogging. The Ottomans and Biazetines also have documented history of having the husband of an unfaithful woman be forced to commit the mutilation. You already heartbroken she cheated, now you gotta cut her face open too. Hard day for those guys. It also established rhinotomy as a punishment for Christian women who had consensual sexual relations with a Muslim man or a Muslim woman who had consensual sexual relations with a Christian man. Chop chop with the chop chopping guys, it's time to be flayed alive. All the nausea for this one. Flaying a person alive has been employed as a method of execution in different parts of the world for many centuries, including ancient Rome, medieval England, and the Ottoman Empire. The process of flaying someone starts with stripping the clothes of a victim and tying them suspended by the wrist and ankle. They always started with the scalp and the head as it inflicted the most suffering and you wanted them to still be alive for that part. Then making incisions vertically down the body, following the legs, buttocks, and torso, they would peel back and remove the skin as intact as possible. In some instances, parts of the person's body were even boiled to make the skin softer and easier to remove. So that's two for one torture right there. There were a few ways you could die from flaying, but never from flaying itself. Shock, blood or fluid loss, hypothermia, or infection are some potentials. The time of death could also be anywhere between a few hours and a few days. In the aftermath, many of these corpses would be hung on stakes for their display, their skin either discarded or hung up beside them. And speaking of, our next brutal punishment is impalement. While Vled Sepp aka Dracula is famous for this torture, he actually learned it from the Turkish while held in captivity and tortured for his own homosexuality. With stake impalement, a victim's back door is forced down on the tip of a long, sharp, greased up stake. This starts the impalement process. The stake is then hoisted up and the body weight of the victim on the grease pole would slowly slide them downwards. The pole would travel up the intestinal opening and up through the body very, very slowly. It was a brutal, slow, and agonizing death and it was one that could take days. Sometimes the Ottomans would flay someone before impalement. Gaunching was another type of brutal impaled death. The victim would be quite literally thrown onto metal spikes, hooks, or rods, and then left to die on them. These hooks and spikes could be found over the edges of certain palace balconies. Gentlemen, tune out and don't say I didn't warn you. The next is the sack squish. According to the 1622 Contemporary Chronicles, the teenage Sultan Osman II suffered an excruciating death by compression of, well, his boys. By assassin known as Pevlian the oil wrestler. That's right, an oil wrestler crushed his scrot till he died. Wild. Sack crushing is a punishment that was performed as slowly as possible to worsen the intensity of a victim's agony and lengthen its duration. And it was often performed by a vice that would make them burst from the inside and then crunch the spermatic cord with a plier-like attachment. This victim was usually held upside down while this occurred so that they're unable to pass out or enter a state of shock while the torture occurs. This was also because the condemned usually was vomiting repeatedly, so it was just easier to hang him upside down over a bucket. Despite vomiting, the men rarely screamed. This is because the pain would be so physically overwhelming enough that it would affect his ability to even breathe. They would, however, thrash around wildly as each of the boys burst and then the cord was crunched. And don't worry, they would make a full day of torture out of this. Interesting to notice how usually these public spectacles drew crowds due to the lack of entertainment and also their intention to be a public spectacle. Well, unlike flayings or drownings or dismemberment, where there's usually jeers and cheering, apparently with a good old sack squish, the crowds remained silent and shocked the whole time. Onlookers, male and female, are recorded to have vomited at the site. And now, a race for your life. This strange custom began in the 18th century and lasted well into the 19th. This custom only applied to viziers of the sultan who committed a crime or were simply told they were being executed. It happened a lot, and for next to no reason. The official would be summoned to a meeting with the head gardener, and after exchanging greetings, the vizier would be handed a cup of sherbet. If it was white, then the sultan had granted him life. If it was red, he was to be executed. As soon as he saw red sherbet, the vizier would start sprinting. Well, that's because the color red was the color of blood, and if the vizier wanted to keep it in his body, he could escape his fate by beating the head gardener, who moonlighted as the Ottoman's executioner, by the way, in a race through the palace gardens. The head gardener was honor bound to a foot race through the gardens to the place of execution near the fish market gate on the southern side of the palace, a distance of around 300 
100 meters. If the vizier was able to finish the dash before the head gardener slash executioner, their sentence would be reduced from death to simple banishment. If the gardener was there, you might as well just keep running right off of a cliff. It isn't clear how this racing tradition got started, although one can speculate it was probably inspired by condemned individuals literally making the mad dash. The last man to save his neck by winning a life or death sprint was Grand Vizier Hakia Sahel Pasha in November of 1822. Hakia, whose predecessor had only lasted 9 days in office before being executed, not only survived the death sentence, but was so widely esteemed for winning the race that he went on to be appointed the Governor General of the province of Damascus. Number 10 is got your nose and your ears and a couple other limbs because ancient civilization globally shared the unique agreement in the removal of someone's nose, ears, or both as the punishment for a crime. Tokugawa era Japan is no different. While flogging was a common penalty for crimes such as thefts, fighting, public intoxication, etc., amputation of the nose or ears or both replaced flogging as a penalty very early in this time, which it didn't last. This period of Japan follows a particularly violent one, and in the time of Tokugawa, they repealed a lot and calmed a lot of the criminal punishment laws from before. Regardless, commit the crime and pay the fine with mutilation. People who experienced this punishment were socially marked for their crime and were banished from hiding it. No big deal for those who had already been punished with exile in accompaniment of mutilation of their nose and ears. Female culprits of crimes that were punishable with mutilation, however, were never mutilated, but they were ordered to parade through the village naked, so I mean pick your poison. Speaking of a woman having to pick her poison, number 9 is the tobacco ordeal. This is one of the most fascinating trial and ordeal ordeals that I have come across in my time researching. While there isn't much information, what little there is is unique to say the least. So, a woman who has committed a crime goes through trial and ordeal the way that a man would, but often has different and less visceral ordeals. A favored way was the tobacco ordeal. A woman would be made to smoke several pipes full of tobacco, and the ash of the pipe was to be put into a cup of water as she did. No ash was to be spilled anywhere but the cup. This water and ash combo would be mixed together by a finger or spoon, and once the woman has finished her appointed number of pipes, she would have to drink the full cup of water. It was believed any woman who could smoke the tobacco and drink the ash water without feeling sick or dizzy was an innocent woman. Anyone who could not was guilty. Guilty of being a normal person, because who is drinking out of an ash cup and not feeling like death after? But anyways. Number 8 is the world's uncoolest face tat. Your parents could be disappointed about that face tat you chose, but imagine how much more disappointed they would have been if it was a government issued one smack dab in the center of your forehead. Tattooing in Japan can be traced back to 14,000 BC to 300 AD, when they were believed to hold a mystical significance. Afterwards, the culture moved away from tattoos well until the Edo period, where it came back in a very different way. For some duration of the time, a stamp like forehead tattoo was the go-to punishment for a non-violent offender, like a thief, a loiterer, a vandal, whatever. It was classified as a type of corporal punishment like flogging was. Now, usually it came with expulsion, which unlike exile doesn't kick you from the whole town, but it can kick you from your previous neighborhood. It was a fantastic record keeping tab, however, as the tattoos were chosen by each region and was unique to them, making criminals from other areas identifiable. In most societies, if a tattooed criminal reoffended, they did receive the death penalty. However, some of the civilizations had a three strikes, then you're out system. In 1745, tattooing replaced the previously discussed facial mutilation as society became gentler and less bloodthirsty. This continued over the years with face tattooing changing to the less embarrassing and quite fashionable by today's standards, arm tattoo. In 1872, the newly established government of Japan abolished the tattoo penalty for once and all. Let's get uncomfortable with number 7, the steak ordeal. This fun ordeal starts with two large vertical stakes driven into the ground, on one of Tokugawa's three execution grounds. There would be multiple sets of these stakes depending on the height and weight of accused facing the stakes. This is because the body was to be stretched taunt between the two stakes tied by the wrist and the ankle joints. They start with the wrist to, sus to suspend the body and make it easier to tie the ankles, but once the victim was up on those stakes, their weight was all on them. Anyone tied up in this torturous fashion was forced to remain this way until they either confessed or, well, 
died somehow. Hanging by the hair of the head was another staking ordeal. Obviously, this wasn't something doable for someone without long hair, but worry not, as long hair was cultivated between both sexes, so there was never any shortage of torture options. While held aloft by two others, someone would tie the victim's long hair into a knot at the top of the stake frame. So, once they're tied, they let the weight of the person all hang from that hair until they confessed or something uncomfortable to imagine happens. So, number six is gonna make me even more nauseous. It's tendon cutting. This makes me very squeamish. I'm gonna go fast. A customary punishment before and during the Edo was to cut the Achilles tendon of both feet. This was to maim a person for the rest of their life. No hunting, no working. Heck, it couldn't walk in most cases, and you lost muscle connectivity that even aided in hip motion. This punishment makes you depend solely on others for the necessity of life. Seeing as this was usually a punishment for manslaughter or a passion killing, your family would have very likely disowned you anyways, leaving you alone to figure this out. One documented account is of an old man who had to move his body by dragging his legs using his hands and carrying two small blocks of wood in each to protect them as he did. If your tendons were spared, it was only to be exiled from your home and city forever or to be executed. And Number five. Hera and Heracles. Bless my soul, Herc was on a roll, and Hera the Queen of Gods was extremely jealous of that. All those other women in her husband's life. Zeus's consorts, and Hera hated the kids that came along with the adultery. One of them being, of course, Heracles. Who puts the glad in gladiator? Hercules. Yeah, that's the same dude. I was a 90s kid. As the story goes, Hera caused Hercules so much trouble that he was actually driven mad on one occasion. According to Homer, just before Hercules was born, Zeus announced a prophecy that would make Hercules the ruler of the heavens in his place when the time came. Hera didn't like that so much. She kind of pushed the birthing a little bit. Hera also made Herc crazy. A little bit of roid rage, you know? In a blind rage one night, he kills his wife and son under the rage spell of Hera. Part of this punishment was that the insanity was just temporary, so when he came to and realized that he John Wicked everyone, yeah, she had won. In sadness, he smashed about 12 labors and got himself back on track. Talk about zero to hero. Number four, Arachne and Athena. Okay, so a little hex here, a little labors there. The wrath of the gods is pretty tame so far. Well, was. And then there's the story of Arachne. Ovid recounts the very talented mortal Arachne, daughter of Idmon, challenged Athena, goddess of wisdom and crafts, to a weaving contest. Yeah, you don't challenge the goats to what make them great, you know? When Athena could find no flaws or errors in the tapestry, she was pretty pissed. When Athena saw that Arachne had not only insulted the gods in what she had drawn, but done so with a work far more beautiful than Athena's own art, she was enraged. She ripped Arachne's work to shreds, and terrified of what comes next, Arachne took her own life. Athena brought her back to life, cursing her after a little sprinkle of Hecate's herb, an ancient poison. Arachne's hair started falling out, and then her nose fell off, and then her fingers, as her whole body started slowly turning into a giant spider. Uh? And this is apparently now why we have spiders. Yeah, thanks to this epic weave off. Number three. Hera and Lamia. Lamia was a beautiful Libyan queen and enter Zeus stage right. Of course, loved by Zeus. Yeah, basically through no fault of her own, she got the wrath of Hera upon herself. This dude's sh commitment skills leads these people to get in a line of fire with some nasty curses. Hera cursed this lady hard. Every time she gave birth to a child, Hera either murdered it or made her eat it, regardless if it was Zeus's or not. Hera was like, Nah, never again. Now eat it. All of them. Even babies that weren't hers. Basically every night Lamia would ravenously make her way village to village eating mother's babies. That's horrible. She swore to bereave all mothers of their children just as she had been once by Hera. Trying to help of course, Zeus gave her removable eyes so that she was blind but harmless in the day. But after she popped those bad boys in, feeding time. Hera's mean man. Number two. Poseidon and Pasiphae. Okay, so we're getting a little bit more into like disturbing graphic land with some of the more cruel things here. What started out as a rumor that some people were kind of smelly is turning into like eternities of pain and suffering and stuff. Pasiphae was a queen of Crete and often regarded as the goddess of witchcraft and sorcery. The daughter of Helios and the ocean nymph Perse, Pasiphae is notable as the mother of the Minotaur. You'll see why. She conceived the Minotaur after mating with the Cretan bull. Minos was required to sacrifice the fairest bull to Poseidon each year. One year, Minos, 
king, refused to sacrifice his most beautiful strong bull and sacrificed an inferior weak bull instead. Dude, don't f with the gods. As punishment, of course, Poseidon then cursed his wife Pasiphae to fall head over heels obsession lust for this beautiful giant prized bull. And many months later, Pasiphae gave birth to a half human, half bull creature famously known as the Minotaur. The curse was sent out as a reminder to her husband Minos, quality over quantity kind of deal. That's heartbreaking. For her, of course. Her husband's cheap, so she has to birth a bull. It's not really fair, I'd say. And coming in at number one, Prometheus and Zeus. And our number one spot, of course, must go to the god of gods himself. He can be pretty shady. Cheating on all his lovers, fighting with his old man and his kids. He's a little unpredictable at times. This one, ramping up the cruelty, we have Prometheus. He was our guy. This demigod loved us and stole fire for us. He fought on our behalf. He led the titans into a trap, securing power amongst the gods again. He was everybody's friend, besides Zeus. Yeah, Zeus didn't like the tricks and the new plans and all the attention he was getting. So Zeus punished Prometheus by chaining the titan god to a rock with the might of Zeus himself. And then, worst part of course, having an eagle day in and day out just eat his insides out. Basically just slowly eating him for eternity. He would heal overnight, but then come the AM, breakfast again for eternity. Okay, so a little humanity never hurt anybody except for poor Prometheus. Thank you for the wonderful campfires. We now have s'mores, they taste great. But Hercules is coming, buddy. He's gonna come save you. I've seen the last chapter, no spoilers alert. Kicking off our list at number 10, stealing. Stealing today, okay, I mean, it depends what you take and most of the time your family doesn't end up abandoning you in the woods, right? I mean, hopefully, right? The Vikings, they didn't play around. Materials were sparse back then. It was hard to replace stolen goods. And the deed of stealing back in the Viking age had severe consequences. The Vikings believed that if you stole, you were a coward. Yeah, and I kind of agree, my bike got stolen twice growing up. Cowards? Both of them. Maybe it was the same guy. I don't know. Stealing was a different kind of low to Vikings, and I'm sure many of you can see eye to eye with this. But when you steal from somebody, they don't have a chance to defend themselves, right? There's no honor. There's no battle for land. No fight for property. No bout for glory. It's just a shameless act, right? Raiding and stealing were two very different concepts in the Viking age, because you're probably asking yourself, wait, didn't the Vikings do that horrible stuff where they stole everyone's land? They did, but it was different, apparently. They viewed both differently although they sound the same in terms of brutality and someone's losing their home regardless. A stealer would be abandoned from the clan, pushing them out into the woods for around 20 years. Yeah, all because you stole a pine nut. Way to go, Eric the Dumb. Get out of here. Number nine, rodeo. Hold on to your butts for this next one. This one I did not expect, honestly. If you were an early medieval Norseman and somebody insulted your wife, first of all, how dare you? Second of all, the legal punishment afterwards it can vary, but one of the most bizarre ways to settle your beef, pun intended, was by involving a cow. Yeah, a cow. He came in, he was brought into an area, hopefully a controlled area of sorts, and that's where its tail was shaved and then covered in grease. Poor thing, had nothing to do with any of this, and now he's over here. The man's shoes were also heavily greased, and the cow was prodded to make it upset, right? Sounds like something Johnny Knoxville would do for fun, but it was not fun at all. The rodeo began when the man pulled on the cow's tail, like a bell being rung. Like, here we go, gong, and then he just got whipped away. Now, this, of course, would upset the cow, and it would thrash him about. Now, if the man, at this point, can keep hold of the cow's tail, for a specified length of time. Why, he passed the test, of course, and then he was allowed to live on. And he had to keep the cow afterwards. What a weird bonding story, imagine that. Number eight, taking lives. Yeah, what happens when you do the worst of the worst? I mean, today we dish out quite the punishment, you even get a Netflix special or something like that. But back then, somebody in the Viking age? Well, it kind of wasn't a big deal. I know it sounds horrible to say, but hear me out. Back then, as long as the convicted were open and honest about the whole situation, like say, I don't know, if somebody had challenged him to a duel, why then it's fair game. One specific case from history involved a Viking man catching his wife in bed with another Viking. Not good. You don't want to catch your wife in bed with anyone, let alone a Viking. That's game over. His feet are hanging off your bed. You're like, oh, he's so large. No. That Viking man at that point could the fella in bed, but he had to bring that bloody sheet to Viking court. That would have to provide as evidence to show what happened and where and why. You know what I mean? That's simple. Today, there'd be a few more steps involved in that case, obviously. But the Viking age, this case was closed. That's it. They're like, okay, Viking law is done. Go home. 
Someone go raid a village. Number seven, hot-headed. All right, here's the deal. We're doing a list on Viking punishments, so as we go on, yeah, we're gonna get darker and darker with our content. For example, what method of punishment in the later Viking age also happened to spread alongside Scandinavia's conversion to Christianity? So there are some thoughts and some actions, some questionable thoughts and actions going on in history. And this punishment was referred to as an ordeal by fire. This would involve the accused undergoing some painful exposure to heat. Maybe you drown in flames, maybe you have to eat some sort of fire or flame situation. I don't know. Either way, it was all terrible and it was very, very hot. They would have your hand put into a vat of boiling water or oil or sometimes make you walk across hot coals. And you can only imagine how creative people were getting back then, right? You never want another rest. Can't even say what happened on YouTube. Use your imagination. Hit that thumbs up and use your imagination. Number six, piece by piece. Okay, what's worse than ordeal by fire? Well, probably amputation. I'd have to go with the latter for sure. That's, it's close. Most definitely. In Viking societies, punishment was often dependent on status. The higher your status, the harder and longer your punishment was. High status folks got some pretty horrible stuff happening to them, honestly. If a thrall carried out a robbery at their master's command, well then it was the master that was punished. So instead of a quick death, they would amputate something. That's horrible. Yeah, continue being a royal, but now your life is going to be much harder. A real life example of such was Nut, the Danish king of England, back from 1016 to 1035. Now the king put in place a horribly grim law that thankfully died with him, but it stipulated back then that a woman committing adultery must lose her nose and ears, while men were merely chastised. Not even close to being fair at all. Now a thrall who had killed their master back then and then tried to run away were to have their arms and legs amputated afterwards. They weren't executed per se, but they could barely survive afterwards. I think I'd rather die at that point. That sounds terrible. Number five, the ordeal by fire. Also known as trial by fire. This one's a little bit different than being burned at the stake. Dare I say it's a bit worse? I don't know. It's certainly going to last longer, which is worse in my opinion. This one here was a Viking punishment that involved subjecting the accused, this individual, to a test of endurance we can call it they had to walk barefoot over hot coals or they had to hold hot iron in their bare hands the belief here was that if the accused was innocent they would be unharmed by this boiling hot fire whereas if they were guilty well then and only then would they burn and suffer this punishment was not unique to vikings it was used in various forms throughout history medieval history it was uh, it was huge in medieval europe they, they loved that they loved uh, ordeal by fire so that was a good time ancient india as well they would perform such a task however there's some evidence to suggest that the vikings may have used the ordeal by fire as a form of of punishment and trial. For example, the Icelandic sagas, which are a collection of stories and history from medieval Iceland, they describe the use of ordeal by fire in legal proceedings, which Again, imagine being born in that era. Like, this is what you have to go and watch. I can't even watch UFC. I can't watch this guy burn. Are you kidding me? In one story, a woman was accused of adultery and then she was forced to walk barefoot over hot coals as part of her trial. Yeah, she emerged unharmed and was declared innocent, believe it or not. I choose not to believe that. I believe her feet were absolutely f***ed, but hey, who am I? Number four, getting even. Taking another's life. Yeah, can't get much worse than that, can it? Nowadays, if you kill somebody, it's a bit different. Now you'll get out early with good behavior, and then Netflix will do four miniseries all about you. Yeah, nice. You get your own Netflix special. Love it. Back in the Bjarki laws in the medieval... Viking era, taking another's life was considered one of the most serious crimes, and the punishment for doing so varied depending on the circumstances of the crime, but well, it was all bad, wasn't it? Back then, if the killer was caught in the act, they could be killed, well, on the spot by the victim's family or by the community. Over in 14 minutes flat, everyone goes home. No trial, nothing. If the killer was caught after the fact, they were typically subjected to a fine known as a wear guild, which was paid to the victim's family as compensation for the loss of their dearly loved one. And if the killer was unable to pay the fee, they could be subjected to other forms of punishment, including exile or even execution. Exile was brutal as well. You were declared an outlaw, then you were banished from Viking society with no legal protections or rights. This often led to you living in the wilderness, and that's terrifying, and that's lonely, and that lasts a while, and that's horrific. In some cases, the victim's family could also choose to enact vengeance on the murderer themselves rather than relying on the legal system. This could lead to a cycle of violence and revenge known as a blood feud that could last for generations. That's crazy. That sounds like it's something from a Batman comic. A cycle of revenge that could 
last generations. My God, let it go, Bruce. Number three, treason. Treason was defined broadly and it could include acts such as plotting against the king or queen, engaging in rebellion or insurrection, or providing aid to the enemy during wartime. Don't be a little snake, basically. Just don't do any of the above. The punishment for treason varied depending on the specific circumstances of the crime and which country it was committed. Now, this one's quite broad. You never know where you're gonna get, basically. In some cases, the punishment could be as bad as getting hanged or drawing and quartering, which if you don't know, that would involve you being hung and then accused until nearly dead, and then disemboweling them and cutting off their limbs before displaying the body parts publicly as a warning to others. So it's, yeah, it's the worst thing you've ever heard, pretty much. In other cases, the punishment for treason could include imprisonment, which is the most normal sounding thing on this list, banishment, or simply a fine. Yeah, here you go, I'm gonna write that for you. Don't do that again. In some cases, the accused might be given the opportunity to plea for mercy and be granted a lesser punishment. I would plea so hard. I'd be the most pleasant, hard pleading peasant in all the land. That would be over so quick, I would beg. The severity of the punishment for treason reflected the belief that the crime was a threat to the stability and security of the state. And you can't really fuck with that. Medieval society highly valued loyalty to the monarch and the state and acts of treason were seen as a direct challenge to all of this loyalty. So as a result, treason was punished harshly in order to deter others from committing anything similar. Yeah, don't quit the medieval times anywhere, anytime, anyone, at all. Period. Number two, rats. In medieval times, rats were often seen as a symbol of disease and filth, and they were blamed for the spread of epidemics such as, you know, the Black Death, stuff like that gross little hairballs. As a result, rats were sometimes used in punishments in order to deter others from committing crimes because, well, they're disgusting. Nobody wants that to happen to them, right? One common punishment was to tie a rat to a person's body, place a metal bucket over top, heat up said bucket so the rat is then forced to burrow into the victim's flesh to escape. Pretty horrible, but it gets worse. Other punishments involving rats included throwing rats at a person's face, which kind of hilarious, kind of horrible, or forcing them to eat a live rat. Both of these sound like fear factor challenges. That is insane. You get caught stealing now, you have to eat a rat. Can you imagine that? So gross. I would rather do the time than have a rat get hucked at my face. Thank you so much, Judge. And finally, number one, the cup bearer. We'll finish with one of the worst jobs to have in medieval times. This one's not a punishment per se, but it's too funny to leave out. This job would make me so anxious. Oh my gosh. In medieval times, a cup bearer was a highly trusted servant in a noble household or court. Now the cup bearer was responsible for the care and presentation of the Lord or Milady's beverages, ensuring that they were of high quality and served in appropriate vessels. Vessels where you can do this a lot. I know kings and queens like to do this a lot when they're giving their monologues. The cup bearer was also responsible for monitoring the Lord or Lady's health as their beverage could be laced with, you guessed it, poison. Yeah, gotta watch out for that, I hope. The cupbearer was often a position of great influence and power as they, of course, had access to the lord or lady at all times and could potentially use their position to manipulate history and gain favor with the ruling class. That would suck one day, wouldn't it? You take a sip and you're like, Oh, that's actually poison. This one's my last shift. That really sucks. Didn't think that would happen today. First up is probably the least horrible you could get, galley labor. And while it wasn't traditional in Islamic law, corvi or galley labor was introduced into the Ottoman labor system over the course of the 16th century in response to the growing manpower needs of the navy and city construction. These sentences were granted for a wide variety of offenses, including theft, atheism, drunkenness, homicide, sexual employment, forced intercourse, bribery, document foraging, the list goes on. A sentence was never under a year, but usually an average of eight. Apart from the offenses mentioned above, galley sentences could be issued in lieu of other sentences if there is a demand for rowers from the imperial or local fleets, meaning the manpower needed for the navy could sometimes override a decision of execution or imprisonment, or even take death row prisoners to sea with them. The catch was that most sentences did not specify the time a criminal had to serve. It was left to the ship admiral or captain to release prisoners when and where he chose. So sometimes when a captain was convinced that the convict had reformed himself, but he needed all the hands on deck available, well, you're not going anywhere. You could quite literally be worked to death. It was just as true for the Ottoman as it was for the Habsburg government then that it used galley sentences to enforce social control, even if the proportion of convicts in the Ottoman navy never reached the levels of the Spanish fleets. The grim reality of the penal system subordinated to the demands of imperial projects is that what separated life and death for someone was 
often whether they are physically fit enough to pull an oar. Next up is gonna sting, it's a kerbash. This follows galley and corvee labor because it was commonly used on the convicts discussed above. A kerbash is a strap style whip that averages a yard in length. Traditionally, they were made of hippo or rhino leather and was used as a punishment and torture instrument. And the state loved these things. They were widely employed by officials for various purposes of the state, including the obtaining of confessions from criminals, the collection of taxes, and the enforcement of corvee and galley labor. In the interest of maintaining agricultural productivity and increasing state revenue, we saw the use of corvee labor, which was crop and construction version of galley labor. It was a common practice for the foremen to enforce this type of labor by applying a whip on the fellahin, which is the name for those criminals. This whip, made of particularly strong but dry leather, was said to be able to peel the skin off in sheets from its blows. If a trained hand wielded this against you, bones could break and skin could blister and even get friction burns. Part of the comfortable use was that it was codified in the Kanan a the 1830 set of codes that dealt with crime and punishment. Within 55 articles dealing with offenses related to land cultivation, damages to public property, the offenses by public employees, 26 articles prescribe the use of a kerbash as punishment. A kerbash was sometimes an instrument used in our next punishment, foot whipping. Also called falanga or falaka. One of the best examples I can think of in media is actually the second season of Criminal Minds, when Spencer Reed is taken hostage by a religion crazed killer who tortures him with this method. Unlike most types of flogging, it is meant to be more painful than cause any actual injury to the victim. The received person is forced to be barefoot so that the soles of the feet are exposed. Ottoman falaka method has the victim also lie on their back with their feet elevated and bound. The underside arc of the feet are then repeatedly whipped. Falaka is usually carried out with a rigid and often heavy stick. It accordingly causes blunt trauma, leaving the person unable to walk and often impeded even for life. The Ottoman version causes more serious injuries than any other because of how the victims are bound. The person undergoing the falaka can twitch and struggle to a certain degree, and as a result, the stroke can land more randomly and can strike more injury prone areas of the foot. The toes and feet bones will break, as will the shins, and then shin splints were also a side effect and some people experience knee displacement as well. The immediate experience of pain is described as stinging and searing. The subsequent pain from the succession of strokes is often described as throbbing, piercing, and burning, followed by fainting. Next up is swimming sacks, and not like an oversized ugly bathing suit, although we've all had one of those and it generally does feel like you're swimming in a sack. Anyways, a common execution for women, when they were executed, was being condemned into weighted sacks and dropped into the Bafora Sea. A story remains of how Sultan Ibrahim once executed his entire harem this way. Apparently one member had slept with another man, or Ibrahim simply wanted to noob ladies to pick from. Either way, 280 women were rounded up and put into weighted sacks that were tied shut around their necks. The reason we know this story is one of them apparently lived to tell the tale. Raising eyebrows in Western Europe when her rescue by a French ship became a public sensation and her story swept newspapers. Hadad crime and punishment is next on our list. Not all of these are found in the Ottoman history as there's some back and forth between the powers that be in the ways of religion. However, there are accounts of Hadad crimes being punished in Hadad fashions. Early Muslim jurists inherited the concept of a category of crimes called Hadad from references to it made by the Prophet. Their scholars agree that Hadad includes a multitude of crimes, including adultery, consuming intoxicants, false fornication accusations, some theft, armed robbery, or banditry. These are considered violations of the rights of God and human rights. These punishments are specified in the Quran and they're doled out differently each time. For example, adultery holds a punishment of a hundred lashes, which would be done with a kibosh. And if one or both parties were single, they should also have a year of exile. A thief should have their hands cut off as a deterrent for further thievery. And someone who accuses someone else of adultery better have four witnesses alongside them. If they can't provide witnesses, they get 80 lashes and will never have their testimony accepted ever again. The Ottoman Empire was known for the removal of thieves' hands and sometimes feet, but also doled out amputation punishment for a few other crimes, such as disloyalty and perjury. Number five, scapism. Okay, halfway through, we're gonna, we're gonna crank it up a little bit. You wanted it? Here you go. It was first used in ancient Persia. Now the victim here would be stripped naked and they would be placed inside of two hollowed out tree trunks or sometimes in between two boats. They also called it boating in some references. Horrible. But only their heads and their hands and feet were exposed and you were literally stuck into this tree and if that wasn't uncomfortable already in the hot sun, you would then be force fed milk and honey until you were extremely ill to say, you know, the least of things. 
everywhere. And of course, after all that happening in a tree trunk as time passes, bugs and maggots would eat away at the victim's flesh, causing infections and gangrene. It gets worse, believe it or not. The process here could take days or even weeks to kill the victim, and it's gonna suck the entire time. This method of punishment was meant to be slow and painful, and of course, in typical ancient fashion, it was very public, serving as a warning, of course, to others who may commit similar crimes. Yeah, don't do that, or else you'll end up uh, a tree, a big stinky, horrible tree. Yeah, let's go. What you get for stealing an apple, I guess. Number four, mozzatello. Sounds like a yummy cheese type, but it is not. No, not even close. Mozzatello was a method of capital punishment that was occasionally used by the papal states for some of the most terrible crimes. You would hope, right? Basically, the person here who was being punished, they would be led to a scaffold that was located, of course, in the public square because, well, folks back then didn't have Netflix, they didn't have anything better to do, so they gathered the troops, headed for town, and they would watch people get punished and die all day. It was really brutal. Can't even watch myself get a needle and people are going to watch this sh It's crazy. At this point, the accused would be accompanied by a priest and on the scaffold would lie a coffin and a masked scary executioner who was dressed in all black. A grim sight, really. Something you don't want to see walking up those steps at any day. A prayer would then be said for the soul of the condemned, which was ironic considering what they were about to do to another human being because the executioner at that point would swing a mallet down on the head of the prisoner and sometimes, hopefully, this one blow would be enough to take your life but sometimes it would merely render them unconscious, which would then lead to their throat being cut, again, all in front of a public crowd. Yeah. Next video, we'll do nice castles or something. Top 10 cool medieval movies. Something less grim, maybe, for a change? Thanks. Number three, the choke pair. Also known as the pair of anguish. Both names are pretty horrible. This one here was a medieval punishment device used to humiliate victims. If you want to say that, it's not funny at all. It's actually terrifying. The device was inserted into the victim's mouth or sometimes other places. Use your imagination, it's pretty bad. And then this thing was slowly expanded using a screw-like mechanism until it reached full size. It would just go in and open up. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty horrible. It sounds like something from the Saw franchise, really. If I describe it anymore, I'm gonna be sick to my stomach. This tool, device, choky pair thing, at this point, it would cause immense pain and often resulted in permanent injury or obviously death, especially if it's in your mouth. Are you kidding me? The choke pair was also used to extract confessions from suspects or prisoners. Now, despite its gruesome some nature, the choke pair remained in use for centuries and was only officially banned in the 19th century, which is far too recent for me. That's, people would, really, that recent? Okay. Today, examples of the device can be found in museums. So if you see something that looks like a, a weird looking metal pair, take a minute and reflect on these horrors. They used to punish men for homosexuality with this. Humans are disgusting. Number two, sensory deprivation. This one was a nightmare, but in a completely different way. Nothing's going in places or nothing's getting stretched apart. It was just you and your brain, which is sometimes bad enough. Now, typically, you would confine the accused here in a dark, soundproof cell, or you'd bind their eyes and ears shut. Terrible. The goal of this punishment was to induce a state of psychological distress into the victim. Now, the idea behind sensory deprivation was that without any external stimuli, the victim here would be forced to confront their own inner demons, their own thoughts and fears would drive them crazy, leading to this sort of mental breakdown, or ideally, for the prisoner's sake here, a confession. Again, even if it's false, just say something to get out of that room. It was also believed that this punishment would be less physically damaging than other forms of punishment, but just as effective, which I have to agree with. The victim would be kept in isolation for days or even sometimes weeks with zero light, no sound, and no human contact at all. The effects of sensory deprivation could be severe. They could include hallucinations, anxiety, depression, and even psychosis. Now, in some cases, victims never fully recovered from the experience. So whether it's a shoulder popped out or your mind, something's gonna break when you leave. And finally, number one, the blood eagle. The best slash worst for last. Here we go. You mentioned it in the last one and we have to talk about it now, I guess. This was a ritual method of punishment that was detailed in late Gaelic poetry. Now, in the two instances where this horrible punishment was mentioned, the victims here, they both happened to be members of the royal family and they were both placed in the prone position and they both had their ribs severed from their spine using a sharp tool. And then they both had their lungs um, pulled through said opening to create a sort of, uh, well, I guess, a pair of wings. How creative. Everyone's so creative these days, I guess, you know? It's like that TikTok. Everybody's so creative. We love a creative Viking. Both instances where this insane punishment is said to have happened, both of them were accused of killing their own father. So I don't know what's going on over there, but quite the daddy issues, it seems. Don't do any of that at any time, I guess. Again, how many steps goes into lunging somebody? Like, back then, with your malnourished hands or medieval hands, I can barely open a box of your 
cereal in the morning. You're telling me some guy pulled ribs out? How strong must you be to pull? That's disgusting. We'll talk about that next time. Number 10, Aphrodite and Lemnos. Kicking off this list, we have some pretty tame punishments. Definitely cruel to say the least, but more on the non-lethal side of things, as God's sakes go. Apparently the gods love to be praised. Yeah, they're uh, awesome. <laughs> But sometimes they do some foul stuff. The goddess of beauty herself, Aphrodite, gets pretty pissed when she's not obsessed over. And the women of the Isle of Lemnos were kind of slacking on the prayer department. So she cursed the people of the island with a foul smell. I mean, that's pretty mean. Everybody stinks sometimes in life, you know. It's life. Little Musk never hurt anybody. But apparently the stink was so bad, all their partners left them and they were quite upset, Bruh. which I can understand. It was probably just the equivalent to like the great stink in Europe, you know? Bodies and carcasses on a hot, grease day just heating up the water and stinking it up. Ew. But nope, now it's a curse. Poor women of Lemnos probably get that rep for a while, you know? Stereotypes, they're brutal. I don't like them. Also, a little salt water under the armpits, Boom, easy fix. Number nine, Demeter and Ascalophus. Demeter, goddess of harvest and agriculture, and her hatred for a certain mortal man. A, a king, actually. Demeter apparently was out looking for her abducted daughter, Persephone, and was thirsty from running around, naturally. She found a cottage owned by a little old lady named Hecuba, asking to wet her whistle and started drinking some barley juice. Thirsty as all Poseidon, she was chugging from all the running around. The son of the woman, just a little kid, basically was like, Thirsty much? <laughs> yeah, you don't mock a god, no man. She threw her drink in his face and turned him immediately into a spotted newt. <laughs> You're done. You're done. <laughs> okay, couple things here. Little excessive, I think. I mean, <laughs> what do I know? I guess you shouldn't talk shit, kid, you know? Talk shit, get turned into a newt. That's the saying, isn't it? Number eight, Demeter and Erisithen. Erisithen of Thessaly ordered all of the trees of the sacred grove of Demeter to be cut down. Yeah, that's a big mistake right there. Industrial logging. One huge oak was covered with beautiful wreaths, a symbol of every prayer Demeter had ever granted. And so the men refused to cut it down. Every other one, of course, yeah, let's go get that rustic log cabin look. Erisithen needed more wood, so he himself grabbed an ax and went out and cut down that last tree. He was cursed by a nymph, naturally, whose prayer had been heard by Demeter herself. Long story short, she was like, you wanna build and eat? No problem. Gave him the munchies of a lifetime. Non-stop hunger, and insatiable hunger. Guy ate everything in sight. He was so hungry, Guy started eating himself. Yeah, all of him. Look, I've been hungry and picked something off the floor, five second rule, no problem but I've never garlic and buttered my own fingers. But uh, greed is greed, firm but fair. Number seven, Sisyphus and Hades. Sisyphus was the first king of Ephra, a cruel king. He killed guests and travelers in his palace, which was a violation of guest obligations, which fell under Zeus's domain, thus angering him. He took pleasure in these killings because they allowed him to maintain his iron fist rule. Zeus was really pissed, yeah. This guy was cocky, and he punished him for cheating death twice. But his younger brother, Hades, caught wind of this and was like, no, 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 no. As a punishment for this trickery, Hades made Sisyphus roll a huge boulder endlessly up a steep hill forever. Yeah, he was like, no, 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 Zeus, I got this one. Brothers helping brothers. Hades then displayed his own cleverness by enchanting the boulder to rolling away from Sisyphus right before he reached the top, resulting in an eternity of getting jacked quads and hammies and an eternity of uselessly, effortlessly, and unending frustration. Yeah, that's really annoying. Number six, Hera and Io. Okay, so we're moving away from kind of firm but fair and non-lethals to a little bit more and more cruel. Io was a beautiful woman to whom Zeus fell in love with, a married man. Ugh. Io was the daughter of Inachus, one of the river gods and king of Argos. She was living in Argos when Hera learned about this secret relationship. And she was a little hurt. I mean, who wouldn't be? Stewing in her sinister revenge, Hera turned Io into a cow to keep her away from her husband. You know, pretty non-lethal. Very mean, but you know, fair. After being cheated on again by the same woman, she was like, all right, I guess that didn't work. And Hera was like, I'm done. She then sent a giant gadfly to sting Io continuously in cow form until she ran away, mad cow style, wandering from country to country, always being stung. Okay, I get this. You wanna stop hanging around my man? You get stung every time, okay? Yeah, 
Bye bye. In our number five spot today, we have the ducking stools. This was a punishment used in the 16th and 17th century England in New England, and it was usually a punishment that was reserved for women. This punishment was given to a woman for doing what was considered unwomanly, whatever that is supposed to mean. Apparently, this included things like having an argument with their husband, fighting with the neighbors, gossiping, and backstabbing. Whoever made these rules had clearly never met a man because, newsflash, everyone does literally all of those things. But hey, clearly the logic used in the past was not logical. Basically, this punishment would see a woman being tied up to a stool and then dropped into a lake or stream over and over again. This was actually a punishment method that didn't usually end up in death, but that sounds like the worst consolation prize of all time. In our number four spot today, we have trial by ordeal. This one is aptly named because it really was a whole entire ordeal and one that I'm sure absolutely none of us would have liked to have been a part of. This foolproof ancient judicial practice was used as a test to determine whether someone was was innocent or guilty. Spoiler alert, it was in fact not foolproof at all. In fact, it makes absolutely zero sense. Basically, the accused would be placed in the center of everyone and they would have severe pain inflicted upon them in a multitude of ways. If they survived the pain, they were innocent, and if they didn't, they were guilty. Like, what kind of insanity is that? Apparently, there were a multitude of different ordeals people could be subjected to, like cold water, hot water, hot iron, really whatever option, they were all bad. What an insane idea to test someone's innocence. I'm just saying. I know a lie detector test is only 80 to 90% accurate, but I'll take that over this ordeal. In our number three spot today, we have death by elephants. There's a lot of messed up punishments we've talked about, but this one makes me extra angry because why do we need to include poor innocent animals in our terrible behavior? You know what I mean? Execution by elephant was quite a popular method of capital punishment in certain parts of the world. The elephants would be used to crush, dismember, or just just inflict pain on captives who were being publicly executed. This method was most commonly used by royalty because it was a way they could use the elephants to signify both the ruler's power as well as their ability to control a wild animal. This practice began to die out in the 18th and 19th century as the parts of the world that used this method began to be colonized. Elephants were the chosen animal in part because of their size and strength, but also because of their intelligence, domestic ability, and versatility. Although bears and lions were more popular used in other parts of the world, elephants had the ability to be trained to execute the person in a variety of different ways because they are so smart. I feel bad for the people who died like this, but I also feel really bad for the elephants who were forced to take part as well. In our number two spot today, we have the breaking wheel. All right, folks, buckle up for this one that was once used as a method of capital punishment. This method was most commonly used in Europe from antiquity through the Middle Ages and into the early modern period. This was a super simple device and it really was just just a wheel, but it was absolutely terrible. There are two different methods with the breaking wheel. Either the person would be broken on the wheel or by the wheel. So basically, excuse the gruesome descriptions, but if you were broken by the wheel, basically you'd be placed belly down on a board, and then the wheel was slammed down twice on each arm and leg, and then on the spine. You'd then be tied to the wheel and hammered to a pole. The pole would be put up for the victim to be left up there to die. Yeah. I know, I said it was gruesome, and we still have another one to get through. Being broken on the wheel involved the limbs of the victim being tied to the wheel and then smashed with a club, and in some places the wheel would spin, just to add a little extra terribleness. The number and the sequence in which the smashes were distributed were not random, however, as they were actually determined in a court sentencing. All right, let's keep going, we're almost done. In our number one spot today, we have rats. Man, this one really sums up how terrible human beings can be. Rat torture originally originated in ancient Rome, and ever since then, it unfortunately has been a part of the most horrible, gruesome punishments. What was once called a rat trap involved a man being tied down to something, and then a metal enclosure being strapped to his abdomen or chest. Inside this enclosure, there were rats, which the strapped down person can feel walking around, and this is when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure. Historically, hot coals were usually placed on top, which of course very quickly creates a hot environment for the rat inside. From here, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out, because just like us, they have survival instincts. The metal enclosure is too hard to bite into, but a human's flesh is not. You see where this is going. I don't need to say more, but just know that it is very, very painful and very, very horrible. And to make matters worse, this is only one of the terrible rat punishments there have been throughout history. So maybe if there's a part two of this video, we'll talk about another one. Starting our list off at number 10. 
don't steal crops. In medieval times, stealing crops was considered a very serious crime, as funny as it may seem in your head. See a guy grab a vegetable and run away. Crops were a vital source of food and income for farmers and communities. There's no Uber Eats back then, all right? Somebody steals your tomatoes, you're fucked. In some cases, the punishment might be a fine or restitution paid for the victim, while in more serious cases, the thief might be subjected to public humiliation or physical punishment, such as whipping or branding. Yeah, branding somebody publicly, all because you ate the wrong apple off the wrong tree. Repeat offenders might, of course, face more severe punishments because something's afoot here, okay? We're not buying your story this time. Such as imprisonment or banishment from the community. Yeah, banishment. Just get out of here. Next village. See ya. Overall, stealing crops was not taken lightly in medieval society at all, and it could result in significant consequences for the offender. Branded, getting branded because you stole a crop. That's embarrassing almost. Number nine, don't steal at all. Yeah, let's rewind the clocks back a bit more. Don't take anything ever. How's that sound? Sweden's Bjarki laws were a set of Viking era laws that governed maritime trade and piracy. Now, they were enacted in 832 AD, pretty old school, and they included punishments for various crimes, including theft and piracy. The punishment for stealing in a Viking society, it of course varied depending on the severity of the crime, the value of the stolen goods, and or the social status of the offender. But for minor thefts, the offender might be required to pay restitution or make amends to the victim. This could involve returning the stolen goods, paying a fine to them directly, or performing a service for them, you're basically a slave for them. For more serious offenses, such as repeated thefts or stealing from a chieftain, a chieftain, the punishment might be more harsh. And this is where we get into the nitty gritty of our list. Here, the offender might be stripped of their social status, exiled from the community, or even, yeah, killed, the worst of the worst. Now, in some cases, the punishment for stealing could also involve public shaming. That in the Viking era, I didn't want to know what that would look like. The offender might be paraded through the community or subjected to other forms of humiliation. Yeah, we'll get to the lung stuff a little bit later on. Slowly but surely, we'll get there. You have to start at theft and then work our way to the lunging and the horrible knee-breaking stuff. Number eight, arson. Capital punishment was a common punishment for arson in the medieval age. Sounds a bit harsh, but hear me out. Last time I was on this channel, I was talking about the Great Fire of 1666. It took 15 lives, but ultimately this fire, it forced officials to rebuild a great part of the city, restructured everything. This changed history. Fire in medieval towns equals trouble gonna spread quite fast. A lot of wood, a lot of woody stuff. So if you were found guilty for arson, well, buddy, you're screwed. Arson, the deliberate setting of fire to property, it was considered a serious crime and was often punished severely in order to deter others from committing similar crimes, right? In some cases, arsonists were killed by hanging or they were burned themselves at the stake. Yeah, burning at the stake was a particularly gruesome form of capital punishment in which the accused was tied to a post or a stake and then they were set on fire. Again, this is all a public affair. People came out to watch this, horrible. Horrible, hide your, hide your eyes. We're not gonna watch this one. Number seven, amputation. While amputation was not a common punishment in Viking societies, there are historical accounts of it being used in extreme cases of punishment, which is absolutely crazy. I'll tell you two of them. One example is the story of Orm of Lyre, who was a wealthy farmer in Norway during the 11th century. Now Orm, old Orm here, he was accused of multiple killings, including the killing of a chieftain and was sentenced to have his hands and his feet Amputated. Yeah, you can't kill anyone when you don't have any mitts, apparently. This was a severe punishment that was reserved for the most serious of the most serious, and it was intended to permanently disable the offender and hopefully prevent them from committing further crimes. Example number two, Edvin Kniffri. He was a wealthy farmer, again, another farmer in rough times. He was a wealthy farmer in Iceland during the 10th century. Now, Edvin, he was accused of stealing cattle, and as a punishment, his nose and his ears we're cut off. Do you hear that? That's Edvin's ears getting cut off. It's horrible. I can't show it, but I can definitely act it. This form of punishment was intended to publicly shame the offender and serve as a warning to others. Yeah, I see Edvin over there. Old non-ear Edvin. That's why you don't steal. Number six. Slavery. Slavery, of course, was a common practice in Viking or medieval societies, and it was often used as a punishment for crimes such as theft, piracy, and debt. As I said earlier, if you steal enough stuff, 
You owe people far too much. Now they own you. According to the Bjarki laws, a set of Viking era laws governed in you know, 832, I mentioned that earlier as well, individuals who were unable to pay their debts could and will be sold into slavery. Yeah, you gotta pay some way. Vikings also engaged in the slave trade. They captured individuals during these raids and they sold them as slaves in markets across Europe and the Middle East. Slavery was an integral part of the Viking economy and many Viking households had slaves actively who were performing various tasks such as farming, household chores, and even military service. The treatment of slaves in Viking societies varied depending on the individual owner, but slaves were generally considered property and had few legal rights. Yeah, we don't look at that often when we look at medieval history. We often just imagine guys like me with big beards, you know? Number five, trial by ordeal. Trial by ordeal of water was Insane. It's it's honestly hilarious to think of. It was a medieval method of determining guilt or innocence. Now the accused would be thrown into a body of water, often a river or a pond, something dirty back then. And if they floated, well, it was believed that God was protecting them and that they were innocent. But if they sank, however, well, they were deemed guilty. They were naughty, right? This practice was based on the belief that water, being a pure element created by the Lord, would reject impurities such as sin. And it was also thought that drowning was an acceptable punishment for those who were deemed guilty guilty. Because, yeah, sure. The trial by ordeal of water was widely used throughout Europe during the Middle Ages and continued until the early modern period. So yeah, it lasted a while. However, it was eventually abolished due to its high mortality rate and, well, lack of reliability in determining guilt or innocence. It was a bunch of bullshit. Who knew? Water rejects impurities. That would be jarring. You try and have a bath, you just get launched out. And you're like, oh, okay then. Gotcha. Heard. Number four, the lead sprinkler. The lead sprinkler device dates back to medieval times, as all these great gadgets do, and it was used as a form of punishment for those who committed crimes such as heresy or treason. The device consisted of a hollow metal sphere with a long handle. It looks like something you'd get from Elden Ring. It's like a weird looking wand, I don't know. It was then filled with molten lead or boiling oil. You already know where I'm going with this one. The Punisher would then hold the sphere over the victim's naked body, always naked, again, and then allow the hot liquid to drip through small holes onto your skin, causing severe burns and excruciating pain. Now, over time, variations of the lead sprinkler were developed, including ones with multiple spouts to, you know, increase the amount of liquid being poured onto victim or victims. Yeah, they got creative. Just the thing you want to hear in this kind of list. They, uh, they toyed around with some ideas, sure. Number three, the guillotine. A classic, not quite ancient, but we gotta mention it. First seen in France during the late 18th century as an alternative to other forms of capital punishment, all those other horrible versions. Those were seen as cruel and inhumane, but this one, dare I say, changed the game. It quickly became the preferred method of execution in France and was used extensively throughout the French Revolution to execute thousands of people, including King Louis XVI and his queen, Mary Antoinette. The guillotine's popularity spread throughout Europe with several countries adopting it as their primary means of capital punishment. They're like, hey, that looks pretty cheap and horrible. Let's do that. It continued to be used until the mid 20th century when most countries abolished capital punishment altogether. Now, despite its gruesome reputation, some argue that the guillotine was a humane method of execution because it was quick and painless compared to the other nine that I've mentioned on this list. Oh my God. Number two, the thumbscrew. This one, for some reason, this one hits me the most. Thumbscrews were a method of inflicting pain by crushing the fingers or the toes or sometimes the knees. They would make massive thumbscrews. Knee screws, almost. The victim's digits were inserted into the screw and then it was slowly tightened, causing, of course, excruciating pain and potentially permanent damage. This form of punishment was commonly used during medieval times, of course, and as means of extracting information. Yeah, if you do that to me, I'd, I'll say anything in four minutes or less. It was also seen during the Spanish Inquisition to force confessions from those suspected of heresy. Thumb screws were often made of iron or brass and could be adjusted to increase or decrease pressure on your body anywhere. Like I said earlier, they would get creative with where they would put these screws of death. Not good. Despite its brutal nature, thumbscrew torture remained in use for centuries before eventually falling out of favor due to its, well, extreme cruelty. At what point do you decide, right? Like some guy's like, you know what? It's a little bit too much. Let's get this one. We're just gonna put them in the coffin for now. Thumbscrews are so old. And finally, number one, cement shoes. We'll end on a 20th century mafia punishment because why not, all right? I wrote the thing. I can talk about what I want. Let's do it. You made it this far too. We'll end on a not horrible one. Cement shoes involved placing the victim's feet in, well, as you could guess, buckets filled with wet concrete, which then of course hardens around their feet. Science right there, that's how that works. Unless you have a moving truck thing, then that cement's gonna dry pretty fast. At that point, you're unable to move or escape and the victim is then thrown into a body of water to 
sink down and drown. This brutal technique was popularized by organized crime groups and mafias and stuff like that back in the early 20th century as a way to dispose of informants or those who had betrayed the group betray the mafia. The first recorded use of cement shoes was in New York City in 1935 when two victims were found dead with their feet encased in concrete. Yeah, new fear unlocked. I never knew. There we go. Now kicking off our list at number 10, the boot. Anything that starts with a the, it's bad news right there. Oversized boots made of iron or copper, these are a little different than Uggs. Pay attention. These boots were often brazed onto the floor, so the accused, well, ideally they couldn't move around anywhere at all. Most of the time they were just sitting upright. They were stuck. It was welded to the ground. The boots at this time were filled with boiling water or molten lead, both pretty bad. And from that point on, well, it's not gonna be great. You're probably not gonna survive. Another medieval punishment involving boots, which is somehow worse, in my opinion, was first seen in Ireland. They were lightweight metal boots that were filled with water and then heated over a fire until the water was boiling, as well as your feet. I don't know, comment down below, which is worse? To me, the second one is way worse. I don't like a slow boil, I don't like that. A watched pot never boils. Maybe that trick will work, who knows? Number nine, the instep borer. We'll start at the feet and we'll make our way up to the body. Why not? The instep borer was a medieval German punishment instrument. Again, quite creative, these medieval folks. This iron boot was much more mobile than the last pair of boots, that one for sure. See, this was just one shoe, rather. A shoe that hinged open to allow your foot to slide in. And then from then on out, just trouble. Slow chaos. A crank would protrude out of the top of the foot, and if you were to turn said crank slowly, well, on the inside of this iron shoe was a thick serrated iron blade, cutting deeper and deeper with each rotation of the crank. This location of this crank was purposeful because most of the time, the accused would bleed out fast. No recovering from that one. Still better than Uggs, in my opinion, but whatever. Number eight. Branks. Ah, the branks. Here we go. Sounds horrible. Branks were used to punish nagging wives, or slandering wives, or cursing wives, or women who performed or practiced witchcraft. If you criticize Christianity, love it. But if you had an opinion or you can do math, you get the branks pretty much. It was horrible. A scold's bridle, or branks, much more fun to say, was a device usually reserved for women. Yeah, classic medieval times history. It wasn't just a muzzle either. We always look at it as if it was a muzzle. No, it was a lot worse than that. It was a cage for the head with an iron plate projecting into the mouth, even pressing down on top of the tongue. More often than not, this plate was studded with spikes so that if the tongue moved at all, ergo, if you were to speak, it would cause you to bleed out. Now again, you can't open your mouth with this device, so that is double trouble. It was first seen in Scotland back in 1567 and later used in England. Branks were commonly used, again, on women of the lower classes whose speech was troublesome. Yeah, what does it even mean, right? Some shaped like an animal's head so you'd have a cow for somebody that was considered lazy, a donkey for someone considered a fool, a hare for an eavesdropper, or a pig for a glutton. Yeah, God forbid you had an opinion in the dark ages. Number seven, the iron chair. Not to be confused with the iron throne, although I'm sure that one wasn't too comfortable to sit on. Just a chair of swords. The iron chair has spikes covering the back, all along the armrests, the seat, there's spikes, there's spikes everywhere, it's dangerous. 500 to 1500 rusty spikes on average per chair. That's a lot of work, it's a lot of welding work, my gosh. The victim's wrists were tied to the chair, of course, because you'll wanna get off of it immediately. Now that's bad enough, being stuck sitting on this chair, but some variants got creative and made it even somehow worse. Some variants of the iron chair had holes underneath the chair's bottom, and that's where red hot coals would be placed to cause you severe burns. It's like from Casino Royale, only a lot Lot, lot worse. Sometimes weights would even be added, making matters much worse. Now this chair was meant to get a confession out of the accused because although it sounds quite fatal, no spikes could actually penetrate a vital organ and wounds were closed immediately by the spikes themselves. Sounds awful, but it wasn't the worst. I mean, it is, but you know what I mean. You didn't die all the time. Number six, coffins. I'm not talking about, you know, these types of coffins with vampires like, you know, coffins you bury in the ground. That would be a bad way to go out, no doubt about it. But this coffin that I'm talking about, much, much worse. Here, the victim was placed up high, not down below. They were placed up high in a cage that was so small, you could barely fit inside of it. Stuck in one spot, usually with limbs sticking out. The live victim was most of the time left to starve or die of thirst or exposure. Yeah, those limbs sticking out, insects, the sun all day, it doesn't matter what you get at this point, but it's slow and it's gonna suck. And of course, in medieval fashion, it's gonna be quite public. Everyone's not working, no one has jobs in medieval times, we're all just watching some guy stuck in a cage, we're like, sure, this is it, we're living, UFC. Number five, 
keel hauling. Not to be confused with Kegels, keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and all that jazz. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles, then they're lowered to the keel of the ship where all the sharp barnacles live. After so long, these ships are so old, it's just piled on layers and layers of barnacles. Then they would get dragged all along them with the water and everything. Water plus pain, it's a lot, it's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles in the sea, no chance. I'll literally tell you anything, Blackbeard. Anything. Number four, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society, but it can truly be one of the worst punishments out there because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. We were all just in a pandemic for so long. We got so bored and we had Netflix and iPads and I whatevers. I can't even imagine this back in the day. Basically, it's a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no contact with anybody else. Not even like a guard or anything rattling keys like in the old times. It was just nothing. No one would even check on them. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long they forget about their families. And some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they just forget how to speak, really. They forget how to be a human and interact in the real world. Solitary confinement and the negative effects that it has on a person is becoming a wider topic of conversation because of the effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was literally just a room made of stones. It was pitch black, freezing cold, you were tucked away below some janky castle, and most of the time, you weren't really alone. In the dark, nibbling away your little piggies were number three rats another game of thrones classic if you're a rat person i know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their pet rat that's cool but maybe cover stuart little's eyes for this one rats as a medieval punishment where do i even start okay this one was a punishment for the rats at the same time what was once called a rat trap involved a man or woman being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped down to their chest or their stomach now inside this metal enclosure there's rats which are also just loose walking around and the person can feel them the little feet walking around in their skin and this is when the person and still in the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure historically it was hot coals that were usually placed on top or there's a fire underneath which quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside from there, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out, but because it's made of metal and they can't bite through that, they find your skin, and then that, they can obviously bite through. So you can paint the picture in your head. It's disgusting. Number two, the breaking wheel. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost, just lying there, where somebody is then tied to it, and everybody else just hammers them and beats the out of them over and over. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show and whatnot. So once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and turn just to show everybody what's up. Another way to use the breaking wheel, yep, there was more than one, again, creative folks back then, they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it and then all the ropes below would get tighter and tighter and twist. Kind of like the rack, but with a literal twist. And finally coming in at number one, the brazen bull. This one takes the rat's problem and then makes it a you problem. Out of all the ones on this list, the brazen bull is the last one that I would do. Straight up haunting. It's also been referred to as a Sicilian bull, and basically, it's not too complex. There is a bronze sculpture, often in the shape of, you guessed it, a bull. But in medieval times, it was just a big closed cauldron, and usually it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, this was in a Saw movie too, I believe. That's how you know it's a good one, when it's in the movie Saw. So once the person was locked inside or it was leaned over so they couldn't get out, a fire would then be set underneath this bull and then you can probably figure out the rest in your head. They would even engineer the bull so that when somebody screamed, it sounded like a bull's roar. How fun is that? How fun is history? I'm learning so much about history that's fun on Bumblebee. Number 10, trial by jury. The concept of trial by jury can be traced back to ancient Greece and Rome. Don't get me wrong, that's old school. But the first recorded use of a modern jury system, that dates back to the 12th century England. Medieval England, yes, let's get some men in a room and point at witches. Henry II introduced the practice to replace previous methods of trial which at that point was relying on physical combat or divine intervention, all that kind of like that. Under this new system, a group of 12 men from the community would be chosen to hear evidence and determine the guilt or innocence of said accused. Right, a little better, a little, you know, less witchcraft, more, okay, we're all talking now, we're conversing. This system gradually spread throughout Europe and then beyond, so on and Danforth, and it became an important cornerstone of many modern legal systems. Back in the day, this was a noble deed, it was an honor to be part of the jury, you know? Today, not, not really so much, not the same at all. You're like, what? 
No, I don't want to do that. It's gonna take so long. It's gonna be like four weeks of jury duty. I haven't done it yet. I've just jinxed myself. I'm gonna get called any day now. Don't answer, you know what I mean? Just don't answer your mail, don't look, just avoid it. That's what I do. Number nine, the stocks. All right, relax stock bros. I'm not talking about those stocks. I'm talking medieval stocks. Those ones are a bit different. Those ones were very bad. Those are all bad. The stocks were a common form of punishment in medieval times. The convicted person's ankles were locked into these wooden boards with holes for their feet and stuff. And their hands were sometimes also restrained. We've seen this before. Usually people are like this. You go to a theme park, you pose with your family in one of these things. You're like, hey, I'm stuck. You're like, get me out, this is scary. They would be left in public spaces like that, such as the marketplace or town square, anywhere public because, why of course, you know, shame, shame, we gotta shame everyone back then. And if that wasn't bad enough, the accused would then be pelted with food or even physically attacked by the crowd. Imagine that, imagine being so sparse for food and you're like, yeah, let's throw our bread at that guy. It's like, what, what a waste, we need that. The duration of the punishment